Welcome to Wired's live living room sessions, special edition. Good afternoon and welcome to Wired's live living room sessions, special edition. Today's special edition is the second to last for 2020 and is part of a special set of live sessions which we have been hosting to mark special events and days of recognition, which are in alignment with our core focus areas, our organizational values and our mandate. You may be familiar with our sessions as during the months of April to July, Walker's Institute for Regenerative Research, Education and Design and the Caribbean Permaculture Research Institute, CPRI, partnered to bring you live living room, ses live living room sessions twice weekly. You can visit our YouTube channel to view all 25 episodes and the six special edition episodes we have completed to date. In the last special edition session, CPRI's Jen Ward-Clark explored the concept of orphaned crops with regional food activist and entrepreneur Peter Ivey from Jamaica. Catch their conversation on Wired's YouTube channel. Remember, it's as easy as click, subscribe, and watch. If you're joining us for the first time, my name is Keisha Farnham from the Walker's Institute for Regenerative Research, Education, and Design, Wired. Today's episode is focused on United Nations Day, which is officially celebrated on Saturday, the 24th of October. We will be further marking this day and making one small step forward towards the development goals by doing a composting workshop and tree planting at Cocoa Hill Forest in St. Joseph. Follow us on Wired's Barbados and CPRI Barbados IG pages to find out how you can participate. We also want to say a special thanks to Flow Barbados and to the UN Jeff program for powering this activity. We're kicking off the celebrations of United Nations Day today with Dr. Shelly Ann Cox of the Steward Fish Project. The Steward Fish Project aims to empower fisher folk throughout the fisheries value chain to engage in resource management, decision making processes, and sustainable livelihoods with strengthened institutional support at all levels. This regional project is a great example of working collaboratively to address several of the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, all of which we're gonna dive in later in our discussion. Dr. Cox is an early career postdoctoral research associate at the Center for Research Management and Environmental Studies, CERMES, the university at the University of the West Indies, Cave Hill. She holds an interdisciplinary PhD in natural resource management from UE Cave Hill campus and a BSc honors in environmental and natural resource management with marine biology from the University of St. Augustine campus. Dr. Cox has 14 years of combined experience in applied interdisciplinary climate-related research and in fisheries management research. Prior to her appointment at Ceremies, Dr. Cox worked for four years at the Caribbean Institute for Meteorology and Hydrology. Her main task included the development of the Climate Impacts Database and assisting with the development of early warning information systems across climate timescales for climate sensitive sectors in the Caribbean. We are indeed very, very happy to have Dr. Cox with us today. Shellyan, it is indeed a pleasure to have you with us today. Thank you, Keisha. Thanks for having me and happy um, UN Day in advance. Yes, definitely. Yes. <laughs> yes. I will celebrate by having a nice beach dip. Very nice. <laughs> it's the best way, up. right? Yes, it is. Yes, it is. <laughs> and we are indeed very lucky to be able to still go to the beach and do stuff like that, considering what's happening in the world yes, today. So all the more reason to celebrate for sure. Yes, yes, indeed. So thanks for having me and I look forward to our discussion this afternoon. Well, you know, Shalyn, I know we have a lot to talk about, so I think we should just dive straight into the discussion. 
And I think the best place to start is always at the beginning. I know a lot of people may not be familiar outside of the development industry with this project. So this is an exciting opportunity to talk to the general public about what Stored Fish is doing. So what is the Stored Fish project and how is it changing the face of fisheries management across the region? Yeah, so Steward Fish is a three-year project funded by FAO and Jeff. Mm -hmm. And Steward Fish is really short for developing organizational capacity for e ecosystem stewardship and livelihoods in the Caribbean small-scale fisheries. So um, just a very long project title to really yeah. emphasize <laughs> the need um, for ecosystem stewards. Mm -hmm. So in the past, you know, in terms of livelihoods, we would have been harvesting and extracting um, different fisheries. So we want to change that mindset and thinking instead of seeing it as extraction, look at it as caring for your marine resources. Um, because if you're exploiting a specific fishery, say flying fish, mm -hmm. you need to realize that ocean life doesn't really live in a bubble. You know, so the flying true. fish yeah. interacts with the dolphin fish, interacts with the pelagic um, environment. And, you know, there also is the interaction with the fishers as well as all along the value chain for the flying fish industry. So looking at it through that lens and understanding um, the concept of ecosystem approach to fishery, which is the underlying concept for the Stuart Fish Project, mm -hmm. um, taken in consideration um, the human element as well as the ecosystem element, all striving towards human ecosystem well-being. Um, yeah. So, yes, so trying to change the mindset around this. So being stewards, taking care of, nurturing um, the environment, uh, because when you're good to something, it's good to you back. And you. yes, yeah. and um, traditional fisheries management, of course, uh, was species focused. Um, you know, lots of the approaches were top down. Um, there was no interactive um, participation with um, the resource users and the resource managers. Um, so um, actually implementing this ecosystem approach to fisheries has offered great insight in how all of us could work together, given the fact that everyone has um, different contexts they work gathering um, not only fishers are involved in the marine space we have the mm -hmm. tourism aspect as well um, to consider we have the cultural services aspect to deal with as well so um, just to realize that the stakeholder base for the management of fisheries is beyond um, just fishers and the fish themselves um, so the collaborations that we must have um, across sectors so in intersectoral um, coordination mechanisms that would be needed um, to really manage and sustain the resources for future generations um, yeah. so, so that um, new um, type concept so from conventional to now to the ecosystem approach to fisheries and that falls under the the even larger umbrella of the ecosystem based management because um, mm -hmm. ecosystem based management exceeds even uh, beyond the blue space so then we get into speaking to terrestrial aspects as well um, mm -hmm. of course our focus in steward fish is um, fisheries and marine resource governance focused. Yeah. Um, so, you know, the components themselves, there are four components of the project. Um, the first looking at developing that organizational capacity for fisheries governance. Um, the national fisher four organizations within the project countries and there are seven project countries. Um, we start with Belize, um, Jamaica, Antigua in the north. We get down to St. Lucia, St. Vincent, Barbados and, and Guyana. Mm -hmm. And yes, each country has a national fisher four organization. Um, some of them might be already involved in decision making. Some, some of the uh, fisher folk leaders are involved in this project, sit on fisheries advisory committees. They advocate um, to be included in decision making processes. Um, but still, they would have admitted that they lack um, capacity as it relates to leadership, mm -hmm. um, advocacy. 
Um, they also lack the skills in, as it relates to information and communication technology and um, communications, which will help them um, be better ecosystem stewards. Um, so, you know, this component addresses um, that. So if we had to look at it through a SDG lens, um, you could see that this component would address um, SDG 2, um, zero hunger, of course, because uh, sustainable fisheries looks at sustainable livelihoods, um, food and, and nutrition security, um, good health and well-being, of course, um, this addresses that, quality yeah. education, um, um, the Caribbean Network for Fisher for Organization is leading on a virtual leadership institute, um, mm -hmm. so monthly meetings that's raising awareness and building capacity of fisher folk leaders and 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 managers fisher folk managers um looks at gender equality too component two addresses um some gender analyses to try to um, investigate capacity gaps with men women and youth in relation to fisheries leadership and this was something that was brought up as a priority and then of course um 14 is in there as well, Life Below Water, as well as 17, Partnership for the Goals. Yes. And addressing um, equalities as well, too, with, you know, having access to women in decision-making, um, decision-making organizations or mechanisms. Um, mm -hmm. You know, this this addresses that as well. Yeah. But these to component two. Um, component two looks at enhancing ecosystem stewardship. And um, I lead um, this project for Surmese. We do have regional partners that are working on each project. So there are, you know, interactions. And, you know, it makes the project each, even richer. For instance, we have Surmese with our specialty in fisheries and marine resource management. Yeah. Canary, the Caribbean National Resource Institute in Trinidad, they bring to the table their wealth and experience of stakeholder engagement, um, as well as you know their communication experience as well. Um, we have UESERP, um, Caribbean ICT Research Program, a lot of experience with um, information and communication technology, and they're mm -hmm. doing an amazing job in training um, the fisher folk in this project in ICT for governance. Um, the Caribbean Regional Fisheries Mechanism, again, is a partner, and you know beyond their mandate, they're helping to support institutional assessments and um, we have WCAFC as well, Central Atlantic Fisheries Commission, an important actor and then of course the Caribbean Network of Fisher Four Organizations which is um, that umbrella organization for Caribbean national fisher for organizations in 17 CARICOM countries. So yeah. you can see we have these regional pro partners we have it's quite fisheries. expensive yeah the yeah it's quite expensive in seven countries so you know i i well there are four projects and i just mm -hmm. got into two but yeah we can continue discussion and i could give you information as we go through definitely so yeah, yeah. i i you know a couple of things uh stood out for me as you as you were talking about the project so you mentioned an ecosystems approach right yes. If you could just expand for me on what you mean in layman terms by an ecosystems approach, because that seems to inform very much the entire um, ethos of the project, right? Yes. Um, yes. So what do you mean by ecosystems approach? Right, so the ecosystem approach and the ecosystem-based management overarching concept that I was speaking mm -hmm. to, um, put simply, is all about striking a balance. Yeah. Yeah, we know our marine resource stakeholders, um, tourism, uh, fisheries, the light, even general public, because everyone accesses um, going to the beach, you're using a, a resource. Um, so yeah. everybody has their stake in the marine resource. Everyone mm -hmm. has um, what they seek out as a benefit for, for using the resource. And in some cases, there are some conflicts that arise um, you know, for instance, Carlisle Bay, we have catamarans, divers, fishers using the same space. Mm -hmm. um, so how can we solve some of these issues? How can we compromise as stakeholders 
leaders use the space in the best way, but yeah. still ensure that the resources are there for future generations. Because at this so, point, yes. Sorry. So when we talk about ecosystems um, approach or management, we're talking about looking at all the different elements, all the different stakeholders and how they interact in that space, including humans. Um, yes. And you're looking at how that can happen in a synergistic way. Yes, yes. yes. Yeah. So living and living, we have to yeah. talk about the or reef ecosystem. Yeah. Um, yeah, so living and non-living elements um, and trying to make sure that the whole ecosystem, you know, the health is maintained um, so that we can use the resources, um, but still care for and nurture them. Exactly. One of the things that I really like about this project, and you started to go into the different partners across the region, is that it is in fact a regional project. Yes. The sea has no walls separating us, really. Oh. So even though we have the boundaries by maritime law, et cetera, and those things, what happens in Barbados impacts other, other countries. What happens in Trinidad impacts other countries. What happens throughout the Caribbean has a, has a regional impact. And if you want to go further, you can even say a global impact, right? Um, yes. And so having a regional approach to this project, I think, is is actually quite brilliant because, the, you know, doing the type of capacity building that you're doing with the Fisher Folk um, and, you know, just in one country, if you have one set of informed people doing the right thing, it's not enough, right? Yes. And you kind of yes. need to have everybody on all the different yeah. islands doing the right thing and, and being sufficiently informed and being sufficiently, the capacity being built um, for, for them to be able to, to treat the resource. And it's not a limitless resource, as exactly as you said in the beginning, but to treat that resource responsibly. Yes. Shalian, let's talk a little bit more about why that's important. Why is it important or why is it critical to develop organizational capacity for fisheries governments regionally? Yes, well, this is very important because um, as we were speaking um, earlier, you know, um, most of our stocks are regional and fish don't tend to know our maritime boundaries. And if we want to manage a specific fishery sustainably, we need to look at it at the stock level. So for instance, uh, flying fish, for example, is a sub-regional stock. So we do have a sub-regional flying fish management plan in place. And um, these are some of the guidance um, that has been developed to inform each country about how to go about managing their fisheries. And that sub-regional plan too also gives guidance on you know, collaborative approaches that will need to be done in terms of collecting data and using that data to inform um, regulations. At the regional level too, there is the Caribbean Community Common Fisheries Policy, um, which sets the guidelines and, and follows the ecosystem approach to fisheries. And mm -hmm. of course, you know, um, in the beginning, over time, a lot of fisher folk weren't familiar with this policy and the principles that it enforces. So lots of time and effort had to be spent in raising the awareness. Um, there is now two associated protocols, the small scale fisheries guidelines protocols, as well as the, Car the climate change adaptation and disaster risk management protocol um, that just came on stream in 2018. So a lot of people still don't know about the guidance that exists out there. So we, we need to develop organizational capacity about these ex existing policies and, and guidance and frameworks that are there to try to guide how we um, operate as ecosystem stewards. And yeah. then how do we take this regional guidance and adapt it to our national context? Because, you know, these are our broad principles that are tailored to the Caribbean small scale fisheries approach. But then there are so many um, new, new nuances and unique characteristics of each um, island, for instance, in Barbados, you know, flying fish is the is the big um, or the largest fishery. And then you go to 
and even sea eggs. I mean, not the largest fishery here, but very culturally mm -hmm. significant. And you go to St. Vincent and they don't even um, have a major fishery for that. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I mean, and St. Vincent is our next door neighbor. St. Lucia to an extent has um, a lot of economic and cultural importance with sea eggs, but not as, as much as Barbados. So just the dynamics of that, and then even when you look at tuna, which is an international, has to be addressed at the international level because of how um, highly migratory they are. Yeah. Um, being knowledgeable of, of these um, policies and the rules that you have to adhere to and, and how that affects the fisher folk when it trickles down. Because, yeah. you know, the fisher folk, his, his livelihood is to go there fishing, but, you know, he needs to know that, you know, there is a totable, a lowable catch for tuna at the national level. Um, so, you know, you just can't go and, and bring in hundreds of tuna, you know. Um, so having, having that um, exchange, and I would say that, you know, steward fish, starts the conversation but beyond the project's um, lifetime um, mm -hmm. fisheries management authorities in the project countries and by extension um, the CARICOM states have to decide um, that this constant conversation needs to be streamlined within fisheries management authorities um, the operations yeah well you know Shellyanne, I think we you know you, you segue really nicely into my next question because I was going to ask about you know the role that the regional ecosystem sort of would play in creating a regenerative fisheries industry we yeah. we talked about earlier the fact that it's not of um, an infinite resource right yeah. um, we also talked about the fact that you know it's it ha it's something that has regional impact and that the different behaviors of different people on different island has an impact on another island mm -hmm. um, and then you also mention you know the the the, the fact that you need to take into consideration the cultural differences, but also at the policy and law level, you have to make sure that while the policies, et cetera, might be in place, if people don't understand why they're doing what they're doing, then they're less likely to do it. So if I'm told I can't fish this amount of tuna, mm -hmm. but I have the opportunity and I know it's gonna bring in more money for my family, and I don't really understand the long-term impact of me overfishing the tuna, right and my friends overfishing the tuna um then i'm more likely to go ahead and overfish the tuna right yes. so the importance of communicating these laws and why they are in place more importantly to the people who depend on fisheries for their livelihood um is quite critical so yeah. what role does that whole regional ecosystem stewardship play in in really creating an industry that is not just sustainable but regenerative. Yes, and um, this really segues nicely into the overall aim of the project. Um, yeah. But seeing Fisher Four and Fisheries Management Authorities nurturing, um, seeing themselves as you know um, managing this resource and using the tools. So we talk a lot about a fisheries management toolbox and how that would help with a regenerative um, fisheries industry. So sometimes, um, although we use the ecosystem approach to fisheries and conventional management, we have some tools like closed seasons mm -hmm. um, that are in place um, to restrict um, persons harvesting while, um, for instance, sea eggs when they're spawning, lobsters as well. Um, you know, these closed seasons protect the lobsters when they're spawning. Um, conch in some countries have closed season. I mean, it's different. Um, the OECS countries, they have harmonized legislation and our legislation is similar. Um, but in Barbados, we don't have closed seasons for lobster or conch. Mm -hmm. um, but that's, that's one of the tools that you that we use as ecosystem stewards to try to protect populations. Um, we have things like total allowable catches as well. Um, so in fisheries where there's lots of data on um, the total landings and even um, around the maximum sustainable yield, which isn't the case in our data poor fisheries in the Caribbean, but in some 
um, areas, they can um, try to work out what would be a total allowable catch um, where, you know, the impact on the fishery itself, um, although you would be extracting from year to year, um, there would still be a recruitment process that would lead um, to a sustainable resource. Um, so that's another tool there. Um, so yes, as, as stewards, I mean, I could talk about fisheries management tools <laughs> in totality, um, yes. but one that, that actually married, marries um, fishers, fisheries management, ministers, policy makers, and so on, is a co-management arrangement. And co-management where resource users, resource managers work together, um, you know, to compromise yeah. and to, to come up with the best arrangements. So it values um, traditional knowledge, it values yeah. scientific knowledge, and, you know, these discussion happens in things which we refer to as NICS, National Intersectoral Coordination Mechanisms, mm -hmm. um, all part of what we call fisheries policy cycles. And these are platforms where, you know, fishers, policy makers, um, management authorities come together and try to decide, you know, how do we sustain our fisheries or even how do we explore alternative fisheries, uh, for instance, like lionfish, which yes. is an invasive species. So how can we shift focus on that um, to ease some of the pressure on our already um, overexploited fisheries? Yeah, you know, I was actually going to ask you about that, um, but also from the, the perspective of the consumer. Right. Yes. And I know that, you know, one of the organizations that we work very closely with, which is Slow Food Barbados mm -hmm. um, and Slow Fish Barbados, one of the things that they've done in the past is to have like a buyer's guide for what types of fish are being sustainably fish. So as a yeah. consumer, too, as well, it's not just the fisher folk and then the policy makers, but mm -hmm. being informed consumers, because then if the fishermen know that a the consumers are not going to buy certain types of fish at a certain size because we know that those are, you know, in their infancy or they are endangered or it's not a good season for them or any of those um, factors, mm -hmm. then, you know, it, it becomes, it becomes demand, supply and demand. They're going to yes. supply what people demand. Yes. And so is the project also looking at, at the consumer side of things as well? Yes, actually, in um, component three, uh, when we look at sustainable, securing sustainable lively, livelihoods for food and nutrition security, um, mm -hmm. there are some value chain analyses being done. Excellent. And in Barbados's case, they're looking at the dolphin fish fishery. Um, so that sustainable seafood guide that was done by Slow Fish, um, you know, it would have highlighted um, those. Um, for instance, you know, they would encourage you to to purchase lionfish because it's invasive, it's having an impact on the reef. So the more lionfish you can eat, the better. Yes. And then, you know, flying fish and dolphin was a sustainable resource. And this is because they're very short lived and they replenish their stocks quite quickly. Mm -hmm. I mean, dolphin lives for like maybe 18 months, flying fish over a year. Um, so, of course, um, they've been able to sustain them um, the sustainability of the stock so we encourage um, persons to purchase those as well when you get into sea urchins now which is a very complex um, sea urchins that live for three years and you know the stock has collapsed um, over time um, even 1879 we had our first sea egg preservation act so that's just to show you um, the timeline of of how things were you know, they were managed in the resource back then. Yes. Um, yes, till now. So, of course, sea urchins is a, is a bit tricky, although we know how people value um, the roads of the sea eggs. Um, mm -hmm. So, yes, offering that guidance. So, the, the value chain for dolphin fish, it actually starts with the inputs. So, we don't even start with the harvest, the, the fisher that's harvesting. We start with the inputs. We start with ice that's required, the gas, the input inputs as it relates to fisheries management, you know, the data information that goes in there to inform the management decisions mm -hmm. straight to the consumer. 
you know, and, you know, issues of traceability come up when we are looking at value chain analyses. You know, there are places in the States and in Canada where you can go to a restaurant, scan a code and see the name of the fisher who landed your catch as well as the boat. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. And this mm -hmm. is where we love to get in, um, in the Caribbean, um, yep. having that kind of seafood label that people trust, um, the quality of fish, and, and knowing that the fish is, has been caught sustainably. Yeah, I actually, I've, I've seen a very um, low-tech version of that um, locally mm -hmm. here in Barbados, where they have pictures up of the fishermen who, for the cash for the day. So the restaurant does um, local fish, and mm -hmm. they have a picture up of the fisherman who brought in the fish for that day. So the catch of the day, oh, they, nice. they rotate the pictures, whoever's fish they're using for the catch of the day. And mm -hmm. they rotate the pictures and they give a little story about the fisherman. So that's a very low tech version. But I, I honestly yes. appreciated the story. And I think um, even from a tourism um, perspective, people appreciate that little aspect of the story. But, you know, obviously um, from a value chain and from a supply and demand chain um, perspective, it does have its uses. If you are now joining us, we are speaking about the Steward Fish Project. Mm -hmm. um, and Swordfish is a very catchy name for developing organizational capacity for eco ecosystem stewardship and livelihoods in Caribbean small scale fisheries. It's a cute acronym, very much like WIRED for a very, very long name. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> and we are speaking with Dr. Shelly Ann Cox, who is extremely knowledgeable, as you can tell, on this topic, um, I am learning so much, Shellyan, um, and this is really, really right. very interesting. Um, as we we move from talking about value chains, it you know when we look at sustainable livelihoods for food and nutrition and security, mm -hmm. um, how is that interlinked to the regenerative management of the regional fisheries industry? Yes. Yeah, so, well. <laughs> Um, if I highlight some of the work that we're doing with component three and looking at livelihood analyses, mm -hmm. um, looking sometimes at the external shocks that exist, I'll bring in sargasm here a little bit. Um, you know, sargasm has been um, <laughs> an issue that isn't going away. Um, I could talk again for a whole, the whole day on sargasm. <laughs> <laughs> we'll do that in another session. In another we'll, session. We'll definitely have, we, because no, it's a, it's a great subject of interest. And um, particularly as in how do you, we know it's not going away. So how can we use it? How can yes. we upscale it, right? And yes. use it for upcycle it and use it for something else. Yes, yeah. we just produced a sargasm uses guide at CERMES um, that outlines more than 15 potential uses, you know, from agricultural uses to cosmetics to anti fouling paints. You know, I learned about that uh, while uh, being part of the um, authorship team. Um, yeah. So, yeah, it's, it's, it's that available endless. online. Um, yes, I can. I can share the the link with you. Um, not up on our website as yet, but yeah. um, yes, yes, I can. I can oh, give lovely. you a, pre a preview. Um, so. Yes, yeah, so going back to your question, you know, these external shocks that exist, the sargasm, climate variability and change, and as well as um, COVID. I mean, this is something that has taken over a lot of our discussions and how persons are responding to these external shocks. So are they alternative livelihoods? We're seeing now um, some of our fisher folk getting involved in um, things like sea moss, for instance, cultivation, mm -hmm. um, as well as some partaking in, say, aquaculture. We're also seeing them being more involved in things like um, coral reef, um, coral reef restoration. Um, so quite an interesting um, reaction to some of the external shocks. Um, and this is a big part of having a sustainable livelihood, the fact that you can be resilient or even trans transform to another state of being um, just when the resources are, are threatened. Mm -hmm. And then having this back now to regenerative management. Um, so we could look at it um, to the context of um, 
say, coral restoration, um, addressing the ecosystem of itself, making sure the health of the reef is good so that the coral reef fish species come back. And then, of course, um, you know, be able to harvest reef fish again, although that is not recommended right now, but that's mm -hmm. something something for the future if we think regenerative management. Yeah. Um, and even as I was saying, sometimes in closed season for certain things, you 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 switch to alternative fishery, you switch to more um, land-based things. I mean, we have a women's group now interested in exploring things like fish waste to do um, nice. fish silage, or, silage fish, yeah. Yeah, or fish emulsification. Mm -hmm. um, so yes, that adaptive uh, way to to make sure that the livelihood is sustainable. We have um, actually I have a workshop later looking at lionfish jewelry. So trying to to shift you know women that will be involved as fish vendors into mm -hmm. making jewelry in the off season um, or the times where you know the availability of the resources might not be at the maximum. I mean flying fish yes. has seriously declined since orgasm. In 2011 mm -hmm. so we've seen that resilience um in in the fisher fold during that time you know a lot of fishers before would be taxi men but of course the case now in covid um you know and the, the decline in tourism that is not you know a viable option right now so yes. you know yeah people have you know they have responsibilities they have families to support um so you're seeing um different alternative livelihoods being explored and you know all towards this uh, you know common goal of sustainable fisheries yeah i remember when i was young um, my parents fancied themselves um duck farmers for a while and mm -hmm. um, my mom always wanted to do it. It was a project. Um, she loves farming. She loves gardening. And she wanted to get into poultry, um, mainly duck. Mm -hmm. And they did together. Um, the Ministry of Agriculture at the point in time was offering us a course on how to make fish silage. Mm -hmm. um, and they did that course together and would make the, the fish silage and mix it in with the, the, the duck food that they would purchase. And I mean, their ducks were always way heavier. We, you know, they were in very high demand for the period of time that we did it. Um, but I remember one of the things my mom always found very frustrating was to get the the the, the waste matter for the fish. Mm -hmm. So she set up a relationship with a fisherman to purchase it from him, and he, you know, was quite unaware. And many of the fishermen at that point in time were were unaware of how this could be used. Mm -hmm. And once, you know. Um, you know, once once my mom started going to them, they you know they then said, you know, anybody else who might want to get this, and you know, and that mm -hmm. kind of thing, and and it kind of snowballed into um, additional income for a couple of the fishermen because they then linked up with other um, poultry farms and stuff like that. So knowledge is definitely um, very very powerful. But yes. exactly what you were saying in terms of um, not necessarily uh, you know during peak seasons. Um, you're, you're, there's a lot of abundance, but how do you address livelihood concerns during seasons that are not peak seasons or non-fishing seasons or no, you know, those kind of things. And there really are many creative ways um, mm -hmm. that involve other sectors. Um, again, going back to that ecosystems management approach that you were talking about mm -hmm. um, and, and informing education and communication, which leads me to, um, my next question, because when you look at the role of communication, mm -hmm. what role does communication play in changing the way that the fisheries industry is perceived by not only the fisher folk, mm -hmm. but also the general public? Um, because a lot like, you know, all of these things are happening. This amazing project is happening regionally. But mm -hmm. how many people um, in terms of everyday people, everyday fishing folk know about it, but also do the general public know about it and how they can play a role in the overall ecosystem of a project like this. Yes. And, you know, the project itself has been um, doing a bit of initiatives about raising the awareness of the project itself mm -hmm. in the project countries and, you know, even wider than that at the regional level through, through our partners. Um, but, of course, some people... 
um, miss the information because there are on platforms and channels that they aren't logged into. The Caribbean Network of Fisher Folk Organization does an amazing job in terms of communications and WhatsApp. So we find, of course, communication needs to be tailored to target audiences. Yes. And WhatsApp is very effective. Um, for Agreed. <laughs> um, Agreed. With Fisher Folk. So, you mm -hmm. know, Fisher Folk now have... Um, smartphones um, and the WhatsApp communication is good. Of course, they're visual too. So they might have, you know, there is a, a need for some graphics and so on, a way to tailor and package the information so it's easy to understand and, uh, you know, in a format that can be shared as well too. Um, and we are working on an ecosystem approach to fisheries social media campaign and that started um, at the beginning of June, runs straight down to December 18th. So we started with, you know, breaking down what is EAF, what are the 17 um, principles of EAF. Mm -hmm. um, we have a Wednesday woman and Friday Fisher um, feature that we because we realize sometimes these concepts seem, um, you know, up there and airy fairy until people see an example of how yes. people are applying the approach in in you know in their mm -hmm. situation. So you know we have a feature of women and and men working advocating uh, for fisheries issues in their in their um, countries, and you know we are featuring all seventeen countries um, in the region in those features as well as you know throwback Thursday where we look at past EAF workshops and so on, a bit more about what other activities are going on in um, Stuart Fish itself. And, mm -hmm. you know, one of the um, bigger outcomes is this regional code of conduct for responsibility responsible fisheries in the Caribbean and you know that code of conduct also addresses the SDGs um, in there you know we highlight the SDGs that the code of conduct uh, would support and you know that I think is a significant achievement um, for guidance because we took the small scale fisheries guidelines which was um, you know developed at the international level Yes. And tailored it to the Caribbean context. And through the Steward Fish Project, we're looking to develop national codes of conduct for the seven project countries. Uh, so even tailoring it some more so that fisher folk own this, you know, created by the people for the people. Yes. And you know, it instills those good principles of ecosystem stewardship in there. Yeah. as well as help to communicate um, the effectiveness, you know, so something that's at the forefront of their minds so that um, not only fisher folk, but the general public, you know, they mm -hmm. hear that fisher folk are working on a national code, of yeah. you know, well, that they see know, as their ten commandments. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, you know, uh, they are professionals. And a lot of professional fields have a code of conduct. You know, doctors have a yes. code of conduct, lawyers have a code of conduct. So it's only reasonable that, you know, the fisheries industry, that fisher folk have a code of conduct and they hold themselves to that. And you're yeah. so right, by them participating in that process, there is a huge measure of ownership. You know, Shalyan, I know we have some questions from the audience. Um, mm -hmm. For those of us who may be joining us um, or just join us, we are speaking about the Steward Fish Project. And Steward Fish stands for Developing Organizational Capacity for Ecosystem Stewardship and Livelihoods in the Caribbean Small Scale Fisheries. We're talking to Dr. Shalyan um, Cox, who is extremely knowledgeable in this area and at the forefront of execution of this amazing regional project. Um, and we're, you know, we're, let's just jump into looking at our time, our um, first question from the audience. And the question is from Edgewater's. And thank you for joining us, Edgewaters, on YouTube, our YouTube channel. There are several projects across the region that are working on different aspects of the UN SDGs. Do you see any synergies with ongoing or new projects regionally? It's a big question. Yes, there are. There's so much going on in the blue space right now. Yeah. And we have synergies in other FAO related projects, for example, mm -hmm. the climate change adaptation for the Eastern Caribbean's fisheries sector project. 
um, uh, which looks uh, more at, of course, our sargasm work with Surmese um, is addressed under that. Um, but um, that project looks at developing four fisheries um, management plans um, that integrate the concepts of um, EAF, CCA, and DRM. Um, so that's just the, um, the beginning of the overlaps with CC for fish, which also encourages um, the EAF approach. And then CC for fish has seven countries as well, but not the same as um, steward fish. So mm -hmm. there are overlaps and linkages, but you know, each project has, you know, a best practice to follow so that, you know, you start the ripple effect going and countries can have an example of a country in their similar context and use that as guidance for developing their own fisheries management plans. So that's just um, CC for fish. Um, we have um, CLME plus, which is a Caribbean large marine ecosystem project um, that has been around for quite some time. You know, it has in the marine space, it has outlined a strategic action program, which we refer to as the SAP for addressing these three significant um, issues, um, habitat degradation, unsustainable fisheries practice and uh, marine pollution. And, you know, with, with interest, um, addressing those three issues. Um, there are several activities that have been outlined in the SAP. I know and Steward Fish was designed to try to address some of the issues related to fisheries. Mm -hmm. And you know that CLME project um, might even be extended um, beyond its closure um, next year. And now there's a Blue Economy CLME Plus project coming on stream. They are still yeah. um, developing there there was a, a big workshop at the beginning of the year before COVID um, to look to finalize the activities that would be in that project. But the marine spatial planning aspect is being highlighted on the, this project. I remember we were talking about a bit about conflicts with uh, resource users and how do we address that. Um, you know, so going about and, you know, having extensive consultations with the resource users, seeing where there could be compromised, how we can zone certain activities, but then how can um, some of these blue things generate economic um, opportunities? Um, you know, in some cases, some marine protected areas have user fees. Mm -hmm. um, um, so, you know, these are things being explored under, um, I would call it BE, CLME plus for short. Um, there is the UN um, project, um, which isn't blue in, in totality, but, you know, the Rich to Reef concept, we need to be aware yeah, of that. I was actually going to gonna ask you about that, if there are approach. any Rich to Reef projects. Yes, yes. definitely. So IWECO is integrating water, land, and ecosystems management in Caribbean small island development states. Mm -hmm. um, so that's quite, um, again, synergies with that project, as well as um, Mars Mar to R is actually more on a Mesoamerican side, but you know, Belize is involved in that project, which is an integrated reach to reef management of the Mesoamerican reef. And you know, the Mesoamerican reef, you know, is quite large, not as large as the Australian um, reef, the Great Barrier Reef. But it's um, the second largest, right? It's the second largest, yes, yeah. it's the second mm -hmm. largest. And you would um, you would know that, you know, lots of complexities managing such a, a wide ecosystem. So yeah. that project looks at that. We have um, Caribbean Oceanscape project that has wind down, but a part of that project was the um, policy, the e what we call the e-crop. So the um, coastal regional um, policy um, the OECS countries are in that uh, regional ocean policy, but, you know, we take guidance as Barbados uh, from of some of the principles addressed in that policy. Um, you know, ECROP actually looks at setting up ocean governance committees in these countries. Um, so not just fisheries, but um, 
other stakeholders um, interested in the marine space. Um, so there's a lot of guidance uh, with that. We have the sargasm related projects as well too, as we were talking mm -hmm. about shocks and alternative livelihoods, you know. Yeah, I'm gonna make a I'm gonna make a special request right now live on, yes. on the session for us to have another session early next year on sargasm. <laughs> Yes, um, yes. So I'm locking you in now. <laughs> I'm putting you on the spot. <laughs> sure, sure. I can also um, involve I my think colleagues like a, a as well. Huge interest to people. It definitely, yes. definitely is. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mike, it's um, not only the the uses part of it, but you know, um, one of the parts of the uses guide were the were the challenges, but we're getting into issues mm -hmm. like owns the sargasm or harvesting permits going to be needed in the future. Really? Yes. I didn't even think I'm going to think you think yes. they want to just get rid of it. Yes. <laughs> it's just like oh, get a permit some... to have it. Okay. But you know, if it is going to be a very um yes. lucrative resource, it will go from being garbage to people fighting yes. over it. So yes, yes, permits might probably be very, very necessary. Yeah, in Mexico there is no a sargasm mafia. In times what? when sargasm isn't plentiful, yeah, there are people locking, locking in sargasm and selling, yeah, oh, because Mexico wow. and Dom Rep is now the hub for a lot of sargasm innovation. Um, oh, we in the Caribbean okay. are now catching up, yeah. Um, but yeah, these are these are a lot of issues that are at play in terms mm -hmm. of resources. Um, you know, sargasm has had an impact on dolphin fish and flying fish landings as well too. Um, so, you know, investigating the impact and, and seeing how the, the resource is being affected and what can be done to try to address some of these problems. So yeah, a lot going on in our space, honestly. And um, I think that although you know, sometimes we uh, work in silos. We should be cognizant of the benefits of trying to partner and collaborate with um, the different partners in implementing their projects. You know, it yeah. makes us more efficient in, in spending our funding and resources, uh, you know, even communication and getting the word out there. It helps with that too as well as you know if persons see the amount of effort as being um, done to try to you know maintain our marine resources you know they put more value and importance on the fact you know um, i am you know always happy to see more young people being interested in careers um, in the fish um, well, in the ocean, I mean, of course, one of those issues we have is that fishing is not seen as a viable career, although yeah. we're changing, we're changing that with, you know, with all the technology that's being involved in fisheries now, as well as, um, you know, value added products and marketing and, you know, um, in the fisheries field. So just not, yeah. you know, smelly, the smelly, um, fishing Fish, industry yeah, yeah well you're yeah. telling me now that there's a sargasm mafia so i'm just like yes, <laughs> okay <yeah. laughs> um, i was like wow okay yes, um yeah. you know i i what we're gonna do for the audience because you've just gone through um a lot of projects um mm -hmm. and um we're gonna ask you to to provide us with links to these projects and we're gonna place it in the conversation um, area in the chat area of the YouTube channel so that persons can have access to the links mm -hmm. um, because I definitely feel that there's so much to learn like you know I, I knew this was going to be a very informative conversation but I now mm -hmm. feel like you've opened Pandora's box and I'm going to spend <laughs> hours now on Google just clicking on things going from thing to thing to thing to thing because there's so much to learn yes um, but I do want us to get a couple of more questions and before we have to, to wrap up um, okay. So I would ask for the other question, uh, another question from the audience. And this one is from Stefan Barker, also on um, YouTube. Thank you, Stefan. Is there a role for CARICOM here? What do you think it could or should be? Yeah, so, well, we do have um, CARICOM being involved through the Caribbean Regional Fisheries Mechanism, because mm -hmm. um, that's the inter 
intergovernmental CARICOM organization that deals with um, regional fisheries management. And beyond that, um, we were speaking to the regional code of conduct. Um, the fisher folk see the importance of having endorsement at that CARICOM level. So, you know, beyond endorsement um, from the CNFO General Assembly, but bringing it to the CARICOM Ministerial Council, uh, CRFM, as well as CoTED, um, to have endorsement at that level. Um, because essentially you want these principles of ecosystem stewardship to be streamlined in national policies. Um, so um, there is um, a significant role that CARICOM can play um, in promoting the Steward Fish Project and uh, even sustaining it beyond uh, when it ends um, next year, April. Um, so, you know, we spoke about the fisheries management authorities and making sure that some of these concepts and the capacity that has been built would be used in their operations and, you know, they would continue to develop their fisheries management plans, being cognizant of the EAF approach and other guidance that has been shared. Yeah, mm -hmm. um, I, I'm looking at the, the comment section and um, mm -hmm. Danny James, he's joined us on Facebook and he says, I understand the policies are in place and we the fishers at the grassroots level, but we the fishers at the grassroots level needs more information and education. Um, and so Danny, um, definitely uh, Shelly Ann would agree with you. Um, and I know that, you know, we're talking about different ways that education can take place um, yes. through the various projects that are happening. And then as a side note, I think he said, some of us have gone into farming. Yeah. <laughs> I guess in response to COVID. <laughs> Yeah, you know, it's not tax day, but you know, that's not, that's not a bad, it's not a bad livelihood, you know, when you think yes. about, um, when you think about the, uh, the, the register reef interactions, which is a whole other conversation, right? So we won't go into that yeah. because we're, yeah. we're very close to the end of our time, but, um, yeah, it, it's, 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 it's a perfectly acceptable alternative. Um, yes. do we have any other questions? All right. Ah, so we have a question from Jen. And Jen asks, what's, and Jen has joined us on YouTube. Thanks for joining us, Jen. What's the plan for the project after completion? How can the activities in Steward Fish be sustained after the project ends in 2021? It's a good question. We always talk about what's the, what's the impact? You know, the your impact? outputs are done, then what's your impact? Yeah. Yeah, so even right now we're in discussions with the um, Blue Economy CLME Plus project about um, continuing some of the work being done under Stuart Fish in terms of having funds to sustain some of these interactions. So, you know, the regional code of conduct, for example, has been developed, but we need an action plan. Uh, we need to have a monitoring and evaluation framework in place as well. Um, Check-ins, you know, updating that plan every five years. Um, so that's an example of one of the activities that will be continued. Um, I think at the national level within the countries, um, ministers as well as chief fisheries officers and other fisheries officials, you know, are interested in continuing some of these um, activities as part of their, you know, usual operations. Um, and the National Fisher Four organizations as well, having their um, capacity built, some of them would continue to um, share the information within their annual Fisher Folk training programs, as well as in their communications as well. You know, some of them have been um, using their social media platforms to get information out about issues brought up in the project, mm -hmm. um, as well as, you know, there, there has been interest um, from other sectors as well and the importance of uh, when when we talk about some of the marine spatial planning projects that are coming on string two um, there has been some interest for some of the um, activities being done 
um, under Stuart Fish. There is another project that may come on stream that would be addressing value chains as well in different countries. Um, yeah. So yeah, in that sense, yeah. So one way would be, you know, um, continuing this um, within other projects, some actually taking it as part of their own operations, as well as, you know, some of the National Fisher Four organizations taking it upon themselves um, to seek funding and support um, to, to, you know, to continue um, yeah. the education. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to be a little bit greedy and try to squeeze in one more question. Sure. Um, and this question is from Micah Joseph, also on YouTube. Thank you for joining us, Micah. Um, in light of the challenges that COVID has presented, how has a regional project been able to cope with these uncertain times? Do you have any advice about the projects? Very, very, very relevant question. question. Yes, yes um, definitely. As you know, with, with um, engaging fisher folk, it's always best to go where they are and engage them face to face. Yeah. And, you know, the project had um, a lot of workshops um, a workshop designed to engage fisher folk mm -hmm. in training and, and development and so on. So when COVID came on stream, we had to postpone a lot of workshops. Um, persons um, turned to Zoom and other web conferencing software to have one to two hour sessions instead of say a two day workshop to try to engage persons. Mm -hmm. um, it has worked in, in some um, in some ways, as you know, Fisher Folk were some of the frontline workers, so they really didn't stop working. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, we had to do things like not have daytime sessions, but have it at times convenient to Fisher Folk at night. Like the mm -hmm. Leadership Institute is now one month, uh, 8 30 at night. Um, we had to use platforms internally. Um, CERMES were really using Slack for. Um, um, communication among our project team. Yeah. Yes, uh, which is, you know, well, all of us are kind of overwhelmed with emails at the point, you know, so for quick <laughs> responses. So meeting calls. Meetings, <laughs> as well, too. We've been using WhatsApp a lot. Mm -hmm. um, you know, more checking meetings, you know, to make sure things are on track. Yeah. Although there are several delays, um, I think we're also trying to keep positive about the, you know, the importance of, you know, completing these activities, not because we're checking boxes and delivering um, or contributing to the milestones of the project, but, yeah. you know, it's something that is desperately needed. It is. And, yeah. And, and we have to find a way to work around the circumstances in which we're in. I mean, this is... This is actually that uh, how we came up with the living room sessions. You know, we were mm -hmm. supposed to have um, a huge conference, our second annual um, Degrees of Change Climate Change Conference in April, and um, we had already carded all the speakers and we prepared everything. And I was beating my head against the wall because I wanted <laughs> to do it, but I couldn't. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, and then, platform. and yeah, now we have this platform that's allowed yeah. us to share, honestly, exponentially more than I had initially anticipated that we would have been able to spare or share and mm -hmm. um, discover um, at a two-day conference. Um, of course, there's something always to be said for face-to-face -face human interaction, but I think our reach has been much greater than what would have happened in that two-day two-day conference. Um, yes. And I think you know you guys have the, the fact that you know you you have the WhatsApp. You've been considering what the Fisher folk would really need and want, and that's very important. You look at what is available to your uh, stakeholders, what mm -hmm. outlets are available to them, and you adjust, um, you adjust yes. because that's life. Yeah. yeah, that's life. And, you know, you roll with the punches, as they would say. Yes, definitely. Yeah. And the punches have been coming really hard this hard. year. <laughs> Knock out punches know. this year, you know. Yeah, um, we've, we've been challenged to be more innovative, you know. Oh, now, definitely. Online definitely. marketplaces are now becoming popular. Fish is yeah. being sold online. And, you know, even with the EAF innovation, which is another um, story, 
that we can talk about at another time. But I have yeah. a feeling we're gonna have you for like a lot of shoes. <laughs> <laughs> we can have oh my gosh, oh my yes. gosh, Brain, brainstorm, brainstorm. We can have the Dr. Shelly Ann Cox show. <laughs> where we literally run a series once a month on a topic that you are going to miss. I, I, I can invite some of my Fisher folk, you know. Oh, I would love that. I would love that. Can, yes, you know that, that I'm going to hold you to all of these things. Huh? <laughs> There'll be a follow-up email coming, you know. <laughs> well, you know, Shelian, this has been such a pleasure. You've given us so much information. And honestly, um, I am going to have to go and do some research on my own too, because you've piqued my interest in so many different ways. Um, definitely, as, as we said earlier, we're going to post the links to the other projects that are happening, um, as well as a link to the, to the Stuart Fish Project. If you want to find out more about it, I'm talking to the audience. Um, but it's really been um, excellent to see how this regional project, not only, um, I, I love how it's bringing together regional partners and they're working together and, and piggybacking off the of the strengths of each of the regional partners and countries. Um, but I also love how it's impacting the everyday lives of people. Um, and so thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for giving us your time. Um, and to the audience, if you've missed any part of today's session, um, you can catch it uh, later on our YouTube channel, along with all the links that I've set, told you that I'm gonna put up on the YouTube channel. And remember, it's as easy as click and subscribe. And our next session is quite a bit of time from now. It's going to be in December and it will be a special edition session um, at 12 p.m. with Jen Ward-Clark from CPRI. And she's gonna take a look at World Soils Day. And she's gonna look at the regenerative agroforestry perspective. Um, and so we look forward to having you then. Uh, join us again uh, for another episode, uh, another special edition episode of Wired's Live Living Room Sessions. Thank you for joining us.